Stay tuned. Coming up on this episode, I interview Spartanburg Fire Lieutenant Ron Hunter as he recounts the Mayday and writ activation after being trapped under a collapsed ceiling at an apartment building fire. But first, let's pay the bills. Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. Hello and welcome to episode 291 of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this program is to help improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from my office in St. Paul, Minnesota, having just returned from conducting a leadership development program for the Clearwater Regional Fire Service in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. Today's feature segment is brought to you by Sims You Share. Sims You Share is a simple and affordable way to help you develop and practice situational awareness skills. You can quickly build sims from your photos and simulate almost any kind of incident, including active threat scenarios. And the new Sims You Share Command Training Center now lets you conduct multi-company drills over the internet so you can even run drills while your companies stay in station. Check them out at simsyoushare.com. Okay, let's jump into today's feature segment, my interview with Spartanburg Fire Lieutenant Ron Hunter as he recounts the Mayday and writ activation after being trapped under a collapsed ceiling at an apartment building fire. Hey everyone, Rich Gasway here, host of the Situational Awareness Matters show, and I have with me today as my guest, Lieutenant Ron Hunter from Spartanburg Fire Department, who experienced the near-miss event, and he's going to share that story with us, and I'm sure there's going to be some powerful lessons and takeaways. Ron, thanks for joining me today. Um, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Um, let's start out by just, uh, for the benefit of the listeners and viewers, giving us a little bit of your personal background in the fire service. My, I started out as a volunteer um, back in 1993. Uh, volunteered for two years, was fortunate enough to um, be volunteer with the city for a year um, on a reserves type status uh, and got hired in 96 with them. I've been with the city of Farmer for now since 96. Okay. And uh, when did you get promoted? I got promoted uh, from firefighter to sergeant in 95 and was a driver sergeant for from 95 until 2015, 16, 2016 and enjoyed that more than anything else really, uh, the driving because I drove rescue, drove the engine, drove ladder trucks and um, so in 2016 I was got promoted up to lieutenant. Okay. And uh, for the benefit of our of our viewers, t uh, t tell us a little bit about uh, your fire department and uh, and the makeup of your community. Um, Spartanburg is roughly thirty nine thousand uh, residents. Um, it can go up to probably sixty thousand during normal working weeks with com people coming into uh, jobs and everything. Um, so we've got a pretty good size community there. Um, for the department, we have run five stations. Uh, we run four engines out of those stations, uh, two ladder trucks, one rescue, and a battalion. We got uh, 78 personnel on shift or at work, the suppression side. 
Uh, 23 of them are on each shift. We, we run four man engine companies, four man ladder company, and a three man rescue company. Um, do you do EMS? We don't do EMS. We assist um, EMS when when needed, but we don't run first response calls, medical calls, or anything like that. So we're I'm one of a few departments that actually don't run medical calls. Okay. Um, we, we run them if you know if the EMS is somewhere longer on their response. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's the only time we'll run it. Okay. And then uh, how many calls a year do you run? Um, we've gone. We're maybe up to 2,400 a year now. So okay. we started running more mutual aid calls with surrounding departments. So we've increased our call volume quite a bit from when I started back in 96. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for the benefit of those who may not know, geographically describe for us where Spartanburg is or what it might be near that might be a landmark for people. Um, Spartanburg is on the I-85 corridor between uh, Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, you got uh, Charlotte's north of us, Atlanta's south of us, and we run, we're right in between Charlotte. So you go Charlotte, Spartanburg, Greenville, Atlanta, right on the 85 corridor. Okay. And does your department use any kind of mutual aid or automatic aid with any other communities? We run um, automatic aid with the surrounding departments that surround the city. We've got uh, roughly eight departments that surround the city, and we run automatic aid with those departments and they run automatic aid with us so we can we beef up our call our response to structure fires and things with mutual aid departments all right and uh, we're here to talk about an incident that happened on january 6th uh 2018 and uh so let's start by just uh, kind of framing up what that what that day was like uh, what your staffing was like that day, what kind of, what the weather was like, what kind of calls y'all had been running already. Was it a quiet day, a busy day? And then, and then we'll lead up to the actual event. Um, excuse me. On that day, it was a quiet day, actually. Um, January, we actually had a decent weather day, sun shining, nice weather. It wasn't one of our normal January type weather called being, being cold. So we had sun probably 60s that day um it being on the weekend so we had a nice day um we got all our chores done and everything around the station just finished eating lunch um, and it was a normal day yeah for person and on that day you were riding on rescue 60 is that correct yes yep, yep. and uh so what what runs out of the station where Rescue 60 is? It is it a single company station or is there several companies? Uh, we got um, out of that's Rescue 60 runs out of the, the main station uh, okay. along with um, the ladder truck and the battalion. Okay, the battalion runs out of that station, out of the main station. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how did the, how was the call that you responded to? How was it reported out? It come in as a um, our our dispatch is kind of weird on that part of it because it, it was an apartment complex so it comes out as a commercial structure fire um and this one actually come out as a working commercial structure fire instead of just a structure fire we knew it was a working fire because the uh, calls that they were receiving on it um so we knew we had we had a job when we were getting it. right from the get-go right from the get-go we knew we knew we had work when we got there Okay. And, and uh, it was in the attic. Oh, okay. And and was the staffing that day 23 on shift or was uh, it? No, we were probably 18, 19 on shift. Okay. All right. And uh, at, at the time of this call, you, uh, you were a lieutenant on Rescue 60. Um, so... Uh, what, do you, what are you hearing en route to the call? What, what additional information are you getting from dispatch or on the CAD about about the nature of the call you're going to? Um, on, on the CAD, it was telling us that it was in the attic. Um, a plumber was doing some work in the attic, sweating pipes. 
Um, he knew the insulation was on fire in the attic. And um, so that gave us a general idea. But, and we knew it was in between um, apartments. It was five apartments. So we knew we, it was in the middle of them. It wasn't on the end or anything like that. So we knew we knew we had something definitely there. Um, the first engine arrived on scene reported heavy smoke showing. So we knew definitely and it's like, okay, this is definitely in the attic. We definitely got fire and we don't know if everybody's out of the whole building yet on there. Um, visible wise, before we got there, we saw large column of smoke coming from the structure. You can, you could see it. You could see the header from down the road. Yeah. 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 Before we made a turn on the road that that apartment complex was on. Uh huh. So and, and, uh, in addition to reporting heavy smoke, did the first engine report anything else um, about the incident scene? You know, people outside, or you know, they met up with the plumber, or anything like that. Um, I'll be on. I was focused on what <laughs> what I what I had to do when we got there because we had to get positioning for the, the truck and for the rescue that I was on. Um, I I just remember. Some of, some of the residents saying it's in this apartment, it's in this apartment, and, you know, what apartment number it was in. Uh -huh. The line was already stretched in there. Okay. So by the time you arrived, that first engine had the line going in the door front door? Yeah, that, well, I had it sitting out at the front door waiting on um, uh, another truck to get there because they didn't want – they knew everybody was out of that apartment. That's one thing they, they, knew, they did know, that uh -huh. everybody was out of that apartment. So they um, got the line stretched and started their way up, and trucks, other engines were arriving. So mm -hmm. it was kind of, we all arrived pretty much within 30 seconds, 45 seconds of each other after oh, the okay. arriving engine. All right. Would that, be, would that be normal for Spartanburg to have uh, all the companies arriving so quickly together? Um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, we're, we, we're Johnny on spot. I'm going to go to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> we are. We, we, we get places quick and um the mutual aid also was i mean they were they were second engine second due engine or mutual because oh, okay. they're right. right on city limits right close to that station that responded to that call what, what community was that uh it's westview fair forest fire department they were right there and it's okay. right across the city uh city limits their okay. station. and is that is that staffing on that on your first engine four people the, that day, they were th down to three that day. Okay. And then the um, the mutual aid engine, or the auto aid engine, what was their staffing? They, they had three on their engine. Okay. So they were able to line, uh, bring the supply line into them. They got the line to them. Um, their driver assisted okay. with uh, the driver from the city engine. Mm -hmm. um, and then their crew went with the... Uh, initial company okay and and w be because you said the rescue the ladder and the battalion runs out of the same station did all three of you arrive just about the same time same time yeah okay yeah. and then uh i don't want to make assumptions but did the battalion then assume the the command from the engine yes, yes. He, yeah. he he assumed command once um he got on the scene and then he assumed command. That's when he started, you know, giving his what he what he wanted and where he wanted people and, and that type yeah. of thing. So, yeah, what, 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 kind of, what kind of instructions were being um, or orders were being given by command? Because um, you already got one line in the front door with your engine crew and your auto aid engine crew. So just talk talk me through the sequence of this uh, event. Well, once, once he got on scene, he went on and uh, requested another engine um, and another ladder truck. So that, that gave us two ladder companies on scene. Okay. So what's your, what's your total apparatus uh, initially, to this event? Um, our, our initial response was five engines and two ladders on it and another battalion initially. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, some of those five engines are coming from the auto aid. Or yes. one. Uh, yeah. Well, we had, um, let me think here. We had three engines from the city 
Um, and initially two engines and a ladder from the county. Okay. One from the county. Okay. All right. Um, all right, go ahead and continue to, to talk me through the sequence here. Um, once he got on scene, he started um, giving it this. Tagging got on scene, he started establishing established command. He started giving uh, his assignments, what he wanted the truck company to do. They set up on the uh, Bravo side of the structure. The uh, fire, excuse me, the fire was more on the Alpha Delta side of it, yeah. closer to the Delta side. Yeah. Um, could, we, could, we had no letter coming in. Yeah. Let, let's pause for a minute and describe the building for me. Uh, it's, like, it's, it's a two story apartment complex, five, no, it's like five apartments in there. So it's 200 foot long, three, 250 foot long building. And um, so you got uh, just five apartments, just two story apartments in there. Okay. It's not, and it's all wood construction. Newer building, older building? That one is an older type building. Um, and, it, and it's not a sprinkler building. So it's, it was an open attic, common attic, all the way through the whole thing. Okay. And uh, so it, once it got up in there, it started going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, okay, continue to talk me through the sequence. Um, so he got his, he got the ladder company established where he wanted them to set up. So they can go ahead and get on a roof and go ahead and get ventilation started there. Um, second engine was, I said, was the uh, uh, county department. They laid the supply line. Um, the third engine, he went on, had them pull a second line, second line off and start on the, I, remember, I can't remember if it was the alpha exposure or the, or the, uh, Bravo exposure or Delta exposure. I can't remember which one, but he had them go in one of those two structures there to go ahead and start um, checking for any extensions or anything like that that may have been there. Mm -hmm. um, our second engine arrived on scene. They went on and went into one of the exposures and went on up into the attic area to see down further from where the initial apartment was and started seeing if they could hit it from the attic access. Okay. And, uh, so they started making a little bit of headway on it. Um, we thought there was gas line up there because when they got up in there, they started looking and it was throwing flames on there. So they hollered about checking the gas. So he had uh, one of the companies check for gas lines, gas going into the building. None was ever found. So um, that right there we found out was the torch that the welder was using uh, off and it was shooting the flames out, shooting gas out and with the flames. Oh, so uh, it was up there shooting the flames. Okay. So, and, uh, then we had, uh, I think it was the third engine, third or fourth engine. Fourth engine was, uh, the, the red team was up and, um, ours, the rescue team, our, my crew, we went in and started doing our search, just a, a primary search of the apartments to make sure everybody was out. So we knew, like I said, we knew the everybody was out of the apartment that was on fire. So we started on the um, Delta exposure, checked it, went to the Bravo, uh, your Bravo exposure, checked it, and then went in to the uh, main apartment just to help those crews because he had already assigned um, one of the companies to check the uh, first two apartments mm -hmm. on the far, bra uh, far Bravo side of the structure. Was anybody still in any of the apartments? No. Everybody already got out. Uh, the plumber actually done a good job getting everybody. He started beating on doors, getting everybody out. And once he knew this is way out of my hands, and I got to do something. So he, he started getting doing his thing and getting everybody out. Okay. Nobody civilian-wise was injured. On, on there. Okay, good. All right, keep 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 walking me down the sequence. Um, let's see. He had uh, the second truck company come in, set up on the Delta side on it, and go ahead and they uh, got their ladder up and started checking things on the Delta Delta side. And then he had 
another engine in, I think, staging. And just to get people swapped out when we, when we need to get it, get everybody in there. Mm -hmm. get everybody swapped out. And then after that, that's when other things started happening. <laughs> Well, let's talk about that. <laughs> I think that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing that started happening was uh, once myself and uh, the driver, my driver, uh, went into the fire or the apartment that was burning. Um, that crew was up there um, pulling ceilings in the bathroom because um, they had fire up in that area. And something, something didn't feel right with me. I'm like, no, nah, there's 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 too much heat up on the second floor. Um, it's just not in that bathroom area. So myself and my driver, we went to the uh, bedroom next to the bathroom. And I told my man, I said, let's let's pull a little, check this attic real quick. You know, let's pull some of the ceiling down and check it. And we pulled it down, and it's like the sun came out. I mean, there was there was fire everywhere in that attic. Did you did you have a line? Uh, the line was right next to us, right okay. there in the between where the bathroom was and we were, so it was at the door. Okay. Uh, so like I said, we just pulled a maybe, you know, just enough to see up inside there. We didn't pull everything down until we had that line in place. Okay. And uh, we looked up, saw all that. I said, "Get the line. I'll start pulling, and you start hitting." And um, so we started pulling that down. We got everything down. And in the, room, in the room that you were in prior to pulling the ceiling down, what was the heat and visibility like? The visibility wasn't that bad. I mean, you had three, four feet, five feet visibility. The heat, um, the heat was high, but it was not too hot to where it was putting us on the floor. It was one of those that, those type of heats to where you're like, there's something – there's something more than just this small fire that, you know, they're, they're thinking. Um, it just gave you that feeling that, you know, that there's, there's more fire in this attic than, than what it's like. Okay. You know, what it should feel like for that type of fire that was in the attic. Okay. And, uh, and then, uh, so you made kind of like, um, an exploratory hole yeah, yeah, in, the, uh, yeah. in the ceiling to, to see yeah, the, what was above you and the sun, the sunshine through. <laughs> the sun was shining through and the sun was the fire. <laughs> uh, all right. So then what? Um, you got the line. Uh, we started pulling more seal and started hitting more fire and more fire and more fire. And then we finally got the majority of it knocked down. And it's like, okay. And they got the, the uh, roof opened up a little bit down. Like uh, it was probably 10, 15 feet down from where we were at. Um, and then it started clearing out real quick. Temperature started dropping and it was okay. I'm glad they got that hole in the roof. It feels better in here. I'm good to go. And we just started hitting some hot spots right there in that attic area. But at the time we didn't know the other engine company that was in the apartment next door was hitting fire in the attic that had evidently jumped past and we didn't see it but they were hitting fire um, coming back towards us. So we knew we had fire going one way, but it was fire also going the other way. Okay. So they, they did a, a good stop on getting the fire from going further down the attic. Okay. And, um, but I mean, like I said, temperature dropped. Okay. We're good to go. We started, you know, looking around, make sure everything was at, um, he went to, my driver went to the other bedroom and something didn't look right to him. He looked around the corner in the closet and the whole closet was on fire. That part we never did could figure out. <laughs> other than, uh, then we, once we started looking, okay, it dropped down from the ceiling. You know, we got a lot of fire in the attic or in the closet. So we brought the line in there. We wasn't in that room 15 seconds. He started hitting and at that time, Every square inch of sheetrock in a 12 by 10 by 12 bedroom come down. Every square inch of it. There wasn't a piece of sheetrock left on that ceiling. Oh, wow. Come down on, uh, come down on my, myself 
and my driver. I was at the door um, when it come down. He was towards the uh, alpha side of the bedroom, right at the window. And it, what he told me, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what where he was at, you know, other than what, what he was telling me, um, that it pushed him back against the wall when the whole ceiling come down. And it brought me down to my knees. And it, uh, that, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I have no clue. Um, it, it, I remember getting hit in the back between the, the helmet and the air pack in that small space between the helmet and the air the cylinder. And it buckled my knees and down I went. And uh, he was able to knock off the sheetrock off of him. Cause he's a big guy. Uh, he's stout, and uh, he'd come over there, and he told this is what he was telling me was that, hey, man, you getting up? And no response. And that's when he automatically kicked into the mayday and called for a, a mayday. Okay. So were you unconscious? I, he said he called me three times. I, I remember one time because um, that – when he called me that third time, I told told him that uh, let him know my air is getting low. That's the first thing to come out of when I come around. Let him know I'm getting low on air. Okay. And, uh, and you're underneath all this sheetrock still. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow buckled up, folded up like a pretzel. It, it, I was, my head was down somewhere below my knees, it felt like. On me, and uh, that's I said. That was when he come over. He said, he, "I kicked you one time. <laughs> you didn't move." <laughs> I said, "Kick me." Appreciate that. <laughs> that's a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he said, "After you didn't move that first time, he said, I, I knew we got a problem." And he said, I, "I hollered again for you. You didn't answer the third time. That's when you told me to let let them know about the air." Okay, so Mayday was called. The engine crew that is on the floor that you're on, but in an adjacent area, I assume they hear the mayday. They had gone out. Oh, they had gone out. Okay. They had gone out because they were getting low. They were already low on air. Oh, okay. And, um, so it was us just myself and my driver up there. Okay. So what's going through your mind? What is your bound up underneath that, that, uh, fallen sheet rock? Okay. Um, at the time, I wasn't sure what was going on because uh, it, it it hit hard. And then once I realized, okay, I'm folded up, I'm laying on the ground, I got to get up. I'm trying to get a sheetrock off me. Um, he's trying to get me up, trying to get sheetrock off of me. And uh, I'm like, it's time to go. I got to, I got to get out of here. And uh, so – were you hurt? Uh, I was I was stunned. Um, at the time, I guess it was still the adrenaline and everything. I didn't feel like I was hurting that much. I just didn't have my balance about me, and was having trouble walking down the stairs. And uh, okay, well, hold on. So. <laughs> You're able to get out from underneath the sheetrock before a RIT team reaches you? I, I was working my way out of it when they come in the door. I was okay. just about out and hadn't stood up yet. I was able, I got a sheetrock off me, but I hadn't stood up yet. Okay. And, um, so I was almost there getting getting to the stand-up point. Okay. Uh, they, they, they were upstairs. Okay. So the how did the RIT team assist you then? Um. They got me to my feet. Okay. And, and it was, um, I, I, I kind of snapped off of, <laughs> off on them because <laughs> they were um, doing their job. They were, they were getting me out. But me being hard headed, I didn't want to uh, rush, I guess. 
I was trying to get my balance about me. I wanted to be able to say, no, no I'm, I'm walking out of this building. This isn't going to happen. I'm, I'm walking out of this building. You're not carrying me out of this building. <laughs> and uh, so they, they had one on each side of me, just making sure I was able to walk down the stairs. Did, did you know what had happened, or were you still kind of in a confused sort of state? I, I was in a confused kind of state. I, I didn't know exactly what happened on it. Um, as well, I, I didn't know exactly all what happened until later on that afternoon. Oh, okay. It wasn't until well after you yeah, yeah. knew what happened. All right. And uh, I didn't know what had fallen, put it that way. You know, I, I didn't know the whole ceiling had fallen. I knew I knew I got hit in the head or in the back and neck or in that type of thing, but I, I didn't know at that time it was the entire ceiling coming down like that. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so the RIT team's there your drivers with you and they're helping you out from the second floor. Right. All right. And, uh, obviously they got you out. Um, so what happened after you, after you cleared the structure? Once I got out, um, got downstairs, got to the outside. Um, I pretty much hit my knees and then I got swarmed by, I know there was, two maybe two three ems personnel and um some of the RIT team members were still there trying to get gear off and air pack off and helmet off and you know trying to get all that off me while they're while the uh, ems was trying to do their thing it's like okay wait a minute i i can i can move my arms i can i can move my arms give me a second let me let me get my wits about me and um they uh they they slowed down finally. I mean, this it's it was a first for them, so it kind of threw them in a whirlwind too. So I kind of slowed down and let them do their thing, and they they respected me, and I respected them, and and um, got outside and finally got everything off. And before I knew it, they had everything checked, had me loaded. I was sitting in the back of a bus. <laughs> okay and did you get transported ended up getting transported uh didn't want to get transported but uh they're like nah you took a pretty good shot <laughs> you're you're going uh-huh and, uh so they, and, uh so when you got to the hospital and evaluated were there any uh any injuries of any any type that they had found no not a bit. They done uh instead of the X-rays, they done an MRI, and they said, "Don't know how, but neck's fine. Your noggin's fine as well as it can be." <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're, they're, we don't see anything on the neck. I said, "Well, why is it hurting?" And uh, I was I was stiff for a week on it, but they said. Nothing's out of place. Nothing's broke. Nothing's fractured. Nothing. Okay, so maybe like a soft tissue injury of some yeah. sort. Yeah, that's, that's 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 what he ended up saying. It was soft, more soft tissue than anything else. Okay. Um, so at what point in that day did you come to understand or be told, you know, what what happened? Were you still at the hospital or were you relieved? Uh, I think I was still at the hospital. I'm pretty sure I was still at the hospital. I was there, I don't know, uh, three hours, two hours, three hours, something like that, uh -huh. for them to do their evaluations and, and that type of thing. And uh -huh. uh, I think it was the chief that ended up telling me. He, he met us at the hospital, chief did, and uh, he ended up, if I'm not mistaken, he ended up telling me that the whole ceiling ended up coming down and put me to the ground. Okay. And then your driver was he hurt in any way as a result of this? No, no, <laughs> he was not because it, it kind of of what he was telling me the way it come down it him standing there it come down on and glazed him off or grazed off of him and pushed him back against the wall. Okay, so it come down and just across the front of him. Okay, and what when when the ceiling come down was there fire above you guys or was that fire out already? That fire was out already. Oh, okay. Yeah, that fire was out. All right. And 
do, do you think it might be partially attributable to the fact that maybe some water was sprayed up there and it, and it made yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the uh, sheet rock um, heavy? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's no doubt. No yeah. doubt at all. Um, Cause I've done some thinking on it and I know the company that was on the, uh, the Bravo exposure, they had been spraying up there longer than we had. So, and I know we didn't, we didn't put that much spray that much water up there. Cause once, once we got to our, that room that we were in at first initially, and uh, hitting that fire, it, it blacked it out pretty quick. So I know, you know, we didn't put that much water. Yeah. But I know yeah. the other company was up there longer than us, you know, in the attic, spraying water up in the attic. That amount of sheetrock, that water soaked, weighed hundreds of pounds when it, yeah. when it come down and hit you. Yeah. 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 Along with the insulation and right. that was up there too. So. Right. Right. Um, so what – what uh, what happens after uh, a, a May Day event like this in your department? Is there any kind of a, an assessment or a review or a lessons learned or a after action meeting? Yeah, we, do, we do after action after action report on it or after action critique type. Uh huh. Um, that was probably the longest after action <laughs> critique that uh, we I've ever been involved in. I mean, usually you do a critique of a fire, it's 30 minutes maybe. That one was two hours because we're fortunate enough to have audio, video, everything of the whole, the whole operation of that one. And uh, we had all the communications all the CAD reports, all that, and we are able to listen to what was going on, how it was out, and, and that type of thing. Now, was, was the video civilian video, or was it fire department video? It was fire department video from the car, from the Italian's car. Oh, from, the, from like the dash cam? Yeah, dash cam. Oh, okay. Um, so what were some of the discussions during the after-action review that maybe led to some lessons learned that our listeners and viewers could benefit from? Um, one of it, and, and I, I, I take this to true heart now, is regardless of how much fire that we've got in the attic and how much water we spray, I'm putting a hole in that ceiling. I'm going to see if anything comes out of that ceiling water-wise uh, before I even go into a room now. Um, I'll stop at the door and I'll hit it around there and then I'll, I'll work my way through a room now before I even start. If I, if anything like that happens again, I know, um, at the time on that truck there, our, our responsibility was primary search, go in, search, 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 search. Um, not on that truck now I'm on an engine. So yeah, I'm definitely taking that more to heart now. Um, cause well, I got a line in the hand <laughs> and, uh, taking ceiling, not saying destroy the whole room or anything like that. Just an access hole. Like you do for ventilation, you're going to punch a small hole in there and see if any, like I said, any water comes out or anything like that to keep yourself, keep myself from being in that type, that type of situation again. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now if say in the and i don't know you know because this is a relatively recent event so i don't know if you had the opportunity to have something like this happen since but if you went into a room that where you knew water was being sprayed above and you and you made your access hole and some water you know come out then what would be what would be your action to not go in the room or to try to pull the ceiling down, you know, in a way that you're controlling it, what would, what would be the tip on this? Well, <laughs> two weeks later, we had another fire at that same apartment complex. What? <laughs> that, that plumber has been busy. <laughs> and, and that, that actually wasn't a plumber that time. <laughs> that was, I think that had something to do with cooking in a poor vent hood and the fire shot up in that vent hood and went up straight up again in the attic <laughs> That one didn't didn't destroy the attic or the roof or anything, but it was 
it may have been two, three weeks later. And, and were, you, uh, were you on that call? I was on that call. Well, so what, what's going through your mind is you're pulling up to the same address where you've just had this Mayday event two weeks earlier. What well, are uh, you thinking? I got a pipe pole with me now. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I, but it, it, uh, it, I, I'm going to be honest, it, it was scary. I was like, okay, um, here we go again. I, this ain't going to happen to me again. Um, I was apprehensive about it about going in um and i said no I, I got to do my job i still got to go in and i knew the same company first arriving engine was the same crew um and i knew this time they were upstairs the fire had gone and extended to the upstairs instead of the attic um so yeah, I pulled sheetrock at the doorway, the front door, just to see. And they had flowed a lot of water on that first arriving. And I pulled three times and a third of the ceiling come down. And probably a 20 by 20 room. Huh. And I said, nope. I said, we'll pull them on, get some salvage covers in here. We'll cover up what we can cover up. I said, there's nobody going in here until we get some more to seal and pull that. And huh. nobody went inside and everybody listened. Hmm. Um, now, after, I'm going to go back to the day of the event. After the event was done, maybe during the after action, um, did any of the other firefighters or the incident commander speak up about what was going through their mind when they heard a mayday called on this event? The, uh, yeah, they, they all did. They, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the engine company that was on the Bravo side, once they heard the mayday, they knew it was right next door to them and they had already started clearing the wall out to come into that same room. Um, they didn't, they didn't hesitate. They come out of the attic and they started go breaching the walls to come in. Um, communication wise, the, they actually heard it better than the crews outside heard it. The battalion heard it right away. Um, so he, he, uh, battalion chief remained rather calm, real calm about it. He didn't get excited. He done what he's supposed to do. He remained calm throughout the whole situation. And uh, but they uh they, they they got a little worried. <laughs> Not sure you know where it was, who it was, or what was going on. And uh, everybody done what they're supposed to do once yeah. they knew what was going on. Uh -huh. um, the downside to it was once I come out. They seem to have forgot about the fire. <laughs> not, not uncommon. Right, right, and um, that's that's one thing that we we talked about in the critique was, you know, we've got this situation, but we still got this first situation we got to take care of first. You know, let you know, let the EMS handle their thing or and the red team do their thing, but we still got to focus on, you know, getting getting the job of hand done, and. Um, Everybody was like, yeah, we all, we all dropped the ball. Once once we heard Mayday, we knew, okay, this is one of ours. We, we've got to get them out. We've got to do something. And then they said, oh, yeah, we, we still got a fire to do too. So how, what, what, uh, how much time do you think went between when the Mayday was called? And you may not know because you were kind of out. <laughs> When, when, when the, when, how long did it take them to get, you know this from the after action review, how long did it take them to get back around to, to making the firefight a priority again? Um, as well, that part, I don't know. I know how long it took them from, for me to get from the Mayday time to me getting out. Um, how long was that? Two and a half minutes. Okay. 
from the time the initial mayday call went out to me in the front yard was okay. two to two and a half minutes. Okay. Uh, it felt like two to two and a half hours. <laughs> I bet it did. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> it, it did. <laughs> um, Once things got calmed down with that, that's when battalion chief started. Okay, we got a crew doing this. We got a crew doing that. So you know, probably four minutes. Okay. Okay. I mean, some of them, like I said, didn't actually hear, never hear the mayday call. Some of the, some of the crews did. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, so they, they were still doing their normal functions. Yeah. Oh, you know, so they, they didn't. They didn't. Out. They didn't know. Oh. No. Uh uh-uh. were they on the same radio channel? It's on the same radio channel, but it was where that those apartments are located, it's kind of a dead spot for communications. Um and so they didn't know what was going on until they saw EMS running across, they saw the RIT team running in, they saw, you know, uh, one of the other battalion chiefs going out and you know, hey, we need this, we need this, we need this and then it's like, What's going on? Oh, we got a mayday call. And they're like, what? Oh. Wow. Uh, oh. Like, okay, now, now we got to do something. <laughs> so what are some of the other things that came out of the after action review? Um, on, on large apartment structures like that, um, they started dispatching a third battalion instead of two of them. Um, so we got a third battalion coming. He's going to be more of a safety. He's watching out for everything else going on. He's on the backside of the structure. Because the way, where that, the way that structure set, you couldn't get nothing back there. Truck, you couldn't get an engine back there. You couldn't get a truck back there. You only had to walk back and forth. So it was kind of a small area, and not having another set of eyes back there, seeing what the fire is doing and that type of thing. You know, and um, they were able to uh, – get that third battalion arriving. Um, I think they decided on sending an additional engine and a truck to certain businesses or apartment complexes, that same type of design on there. And um, uh, there may have been more. <laughs> it's been, you know, been a year. Over mm-hmm. a year and a half to almost two years now, and mm-hmm. uh, it's and, and it seems to be working. It, it, it but knowing that we've got another engine and we've got another truck, we definitely got another battalion coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so it's not taken away from an engine company where the officers from that engine company was the safety mm-hmm. or anything like that. That engine company can stay stay together, and that that battalion can handle the safety be a safety officer and that type of thing. On the, uh, on the day that this happened, were you, as you, as you were up there in that room that the ceiling was going to come down in, prior to the ceiling coming down, was the thought or concern about the ceiling coming down anywhere on your radar? None. Okay. None. Okay. And had you been on previous incidents any time in your career where a ceiling had come down? Small pieces of it, but never a whole. Not, not, not never a whole room. Um, never a whole room. Mm, never. So yeah, the the concept of that was a, a, what we'd call a novel experience, a first time experience for you to see an entire. What size was that room? Uh, ten by ten, ten by twelve. Okay, okay. Like so ten by ten worth of drywall, water saturated drywall, all coming down simultaneously with no earlier no early warning that it was <laughs> there wasn't a corner hanging nothing the only thing we saw when we got in there was the closet was on fire and the whole closet was and he driver just as he started i remember him starting to open the the nozzle to hit the fire in the floor of the closet he wasn't hanging up towards the ceiling it was in the floor and he opened it up and it come down. So there was zero warning of anything like that ever happened. Huh. Wow. And I thought, you know, 
thinking at the time and before once I got my bearings about me was maybe it was just that part of it yeah. just by the door because it was you walk in the door I was standing there the closet was right there to my right so I thought okay it's just a small part well that's when I found out later on that the hospital and fire marshal come up there because they had to do their thing you know they're part of the investigation and everything yeah. and uh, that's when she told me it's like no the whole ceiling come down every square inch of it come down and early on when you were telling this story you were saying that you had told your partner that you were running low on air um about how much air do you think you had left now, i'm trying to put this in a concept of a timeline of how much how much more time would have had to pass before you would have run out of air if they couldn't get you out from underneath that as efficiently as they did um my vibrator alert just started going off when I told him that. So you're looking, what, five minutes maybe? Maybe. Six minutes. Maybe. And something went through my head. Okay, slow, to, slow your breathing. You know, slow it down because once I come around, that's when I started breathing faster. And after, the, after the third time, I started breathing faster. And I – Got myself, I guess, bearings about me or my thought about me because I told him about my air and I said I got to slow my breathing down. And that's when I started slowing it down. And so, I mean, it, it was, like I said, three, five minutes maybe. Okay. But I was, the biggest thing is I slowed my breathing down. If I, hadn't, I don't think if I hadn't slowed it down, you know, it, it could have been sucking up air, you know, mass to my face. Well, it's pretty amazing that you even just had enough wits about you to even think to talk yourself into slowing your breathing down. That the you know the fact that you were seemingly a little bit, um, a little bit uh, confused about you know, things that were happening. So, the well, thought I, I think that falls back to our some of the training that we've been doing lately. Uh, at the time, we'd been doing several rit drills and and and, and situations like that to where, okay, you know, you, this is down. Now, now you got to focus on this, focus on that, you know, and focus on different things to get done, to get what you need to get done. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we'd been, last year, we, we pushed rit drills real hard and everything, and, and the year prior to that, just getting rit drills done and, you know, bringing you down to, you know, three minutes of air to where you vibrate about to go off. Mm-hmm. And making that last to where you know okay I, I see the I see the light at the end you know at the end of the nozzle the hose I see where the door is let's see if any you know that's all bay type you know training you know working in bays and everything blacked out and that type of thing and um, so it's just getting that mindset to mm -hmm. Pri prior to this event had you had you been uh the recipient of a mayday call previously in your career? Never. No. no. And, for your, and for your department, how many, how many, if any, previous maydays had your department had? None. None. You were, you're the, yeah. you're the inaugural, the inaugural <laughs> journey. No, the inaugural mayday call. <laughs> so, so they got to test the entire concept of maydays and writ team activations and all that training. Thanks to you. They got to yeah. see it. I'll put, Put yes, in the and, and it went well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, were you were you in any way feeling after the during or after this in any way feeling? Um, and it's going to maybe sound weird as I ask this question, but there's a logic to it. Were you feeling at all embarrassed or ashamed that you found yourself in that situation, and then they had to call a mayday for you, or or were you were you pretty much okay with that? At first, I was. You know, it's like, I can't believe this happened to me. You know, it's, I don't know if it was embarrassment. I I don't get embarrassed too easy on the job. It's, okay, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, at first I was, and I thought, well, you know, it happened. If we can learn from this, that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, you know, if I was embarrassed about it or not. I don't care if I was embarrassed about it or not. As long as each person that was on that call 
can say, okay, this happened then and take something out of that and learn from it and bring it back to their department for the, for our County guys that responded with us. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. Taking something from it. What were the conversations like with your partner after this? After, um, after the event occurred? Oh, what he gave me a hard time. <laughs> he gave me a real hard time. <laughs> Man, you're not supposed to be doing that kind of stuff. And uh, I had to kick you in the head three or four times to get you to come around. And, you know, and he threw a few other choice words in there about it. <laughs> and uh, but he said, but. You know. Was he scared? Listen to the radio? No. Listen to the call? No. You would have never thought he was scared at all. He said, after the fact, yeah, it scared, it scared me. He said it scared him. He said, but he, he remained calm when he, he gave clear direction, guidance, where we were at, what had happened, everything on it. And um, if he was still driving today, I would have him driving any truck I got. Mm -hmm. He got promoted, you know, about six months ago. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we didn't have any conversations about um, family or anything like that before we hit the recording. But I'm curious is if there was anybody that you would consider, you know, your inner, inner circle of friends or family who are not associated with the fire department did you tell any of them what happened after this happened? Yes. Yes, I did. I, I told, I told, I've told everybody. Okay. And I, haven't, and, I haven't kept anything about it and I'm not going to keep anything about it. I think that hurts you more than anything by keeping stuff like that bottled up. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about it, the better you're going to be on that. Don't keep it bottled up. I mean, yeah, it still gets you inside here, but I, no, I, I talk about it as much as I can talk about it. Uh huh. You know, I, I don't want to see anybody else and end up in a worse situation because of something stupid that I didn't think about doing before. Yeah. Well, know, right the, reason, or, the reason I ask is, I, is I, I've had people on this podcast who had, like you, pretty significant events occur that they never ever told their significant other or anyone close to them, never told them about it. And they and there they are on my show telling the world about it. <laughs> they, they, they haven't told, told their, their significant other or their, their kids. And, you know, some of them have little kids, so they don't tell them, but you know, adult children or, or mom and dad, or, you know, they just don't, they just don't say anything about it. I'm going to, Adult son, and I've told him about it. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. Is there, is, there, is there anything that you would want to share that you haven't been able to yet because I didn't ask you the right question? Um, stick to your training was the biggest thing. You know, take it, take it to heart. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all train. It's like, you know, okay, you know, we go through the drills, we go through the motions, we go through it, but you got to start taking it more to heart to it about it. But on the flip side of that, you've got to start making it to where it's an actual situation instead of the chalkboard or dry erase board or engine room or anything like that. We've got to start making it more real for, for everybody to – wake up and say, okay, yeah, this really could happen. Uh, and I know it's hard to do some training situations. It's hard to do, take that situation in a, in a training aspect of it because you don't want to hurt nobody in a training. You don't want nobody to get hurt in training. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you've got to yourself and people who do your training and conduct your training has got to try to get, more reality, more life, more real on it. And um, I said with the writ drills that we were doing, I think that was, that was the biggest thing that, you know, we, 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 we do that type of training. We try to make it real as possible and, and things like that. Ron, when you were going through the writ training, 
were you were you thinking while you were going through the writ training did it, did it ever occur to you as you're learning how to be part of the writ team and to perform writ operations as you were going through that training were you ever thinking that you would be the the first recipient of the writ team activation as you were doing the training were you thinking this, i might be the first one well that's that's uh, that's the way we done the training was make it think it that this is you sitting here you know and um okay i gotta get myself out of here and i mean we, we didn't we don't use mannequins or anything like that we actually use firemen laying there fiber alert going off you know we'll do the laying stuff on people, not falling on them, but, you know, laying stuff on them. And um, so, yeah, we, we, that's, that's the way, good way we do a lot of our RIP training is, you know, in, in a confined space and make it as real on that. But as for thinking I'd be the first one involved in it, you know, in that type of situation, never crossed my mind. And it, and it won't cross anybody's mind. I bet it didn't cross not a, one of them that was on that call that day that it would actually, it would happen. I mean, you, you hope it never does. You know, when all the training that firemen do all over the country, never hope that all the training they do is going to happen. Yeah. But, I mean, we do it to be ready for anything, and that day those guys were ready for what got thrown at them at a yeah. second's notice. And it wasn't a moment, so it was a second's notice. Yeah. Nice. Those guys were ready. Well, I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank you for coming on to the show, being my guest, sharing – your story with others and uh, being so uh, open and honest with all the details of what happened, how, why, what you learned from it, what your department learned from it, um, how it changed some of the things, the way that your department operates, like the additional, the additional um, battalion and other uh, companies that are added to the response now and, and the value of that extra staffing and such really, really good uh, valuable lessons learned. So thank you for coming on and being my guest today. Thank you, Lieutenant Ron Hunter, for sharing your story of your May Day and your writ activation. The Situation Awareness Matters show was launched in 2014 with a purpose to give a platform to those who've had near-miss events and stories to tell just like the one you just watched and listened to. When I'm on the road delivering classes on situational awareness, I often ask attendees about their near-miss events that they've had, and they share some amazing stories, just like Ron did at a class that we were at recently. Those stories motivated me to launch this podcast, so those lessons learned could be shared with a bigger audience, you. The Situational Awareness Matters show podcasted as SA Matters Radio and our companion video program on the SA Matters TV channel on YouTube along with other downloads have been other video downloads have been downloaded more than 800,000 times. I am so thankful for your support and feel so honored to be able to provide a platform for these amazing stories to be shared. If you like the show, please consider doing me a solid favor and subscribe. For the audio version of the show, search for the SA Matters Radio on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, or iHeartRadio. For the video version, subscribe to SA Matters TV on YouTube. If you find the show valuable, I really would appreciate it if you would give the show a rating and write a review. Your ratings and reviews help others to find the show, but more importantly, your feedback inspires me to want to work even harder for you. I think Rich's, Rich's ability to, to, to connect with any crowd, that's a, that's a gift that he has, and, it, and it's easily transferable. This is the second or third time that I've heard him speak. There's some teeth to, to the information that he, that he brings. It's been really good. Good mixes. He knows when to throw in a joke here and there to get you back involved. Some tools. Um, I'm a new lieutenant, so very, very interesting. And some of these things I can take back to the station and use with some of the new firefighters I have my, on my crew. Something to get you thinking about your job more, big picture type stuff. I've seen him before. A good review for sure. I have heard him before, yes. After he speaks, there's usually an enlightenment because now they're more aware of what's going on around them and what they're experiencing as they're responding to calls. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable. I'm enjoying it so far. <laughs>
and that intuition. That's a big one. Um, the video that you just showed up here. We're getting a lot out of this. I think this is a really good seminar, especially for new people and old. So I think it's, it's very informative. This talk gives us more ammunition to, to do all three. They're relatable to what we have experienced or very well could experience. So it makes it easy to let the knowledge sink in. I mean, it's awesome. A lot of stories you can usually relate to yourself and, and calls you have been on, you know, aha moment. Like, he just helps you focus on picking out the right things. It's, it's awesome. It's a refresher and keeps my eyes open. It's good stuff. If people listen to the message that he has, it's an incredible message delivered by a very com compassionate person. Strategy and tactics are going to always change. Situation awareness is it doesn't change. You're all, it's always there. He's got some good stories to tell, and he's very thorough with his stories, and it's uh, interesting listening to him. Very clear speaker, and he, he talks um, on our level because he's been there, he's been in the trenches. I think he's doing well, and I'm looking forward to the second half. Since 2007, Situation Awareness Matters instructors have helped more than 1,300 organizations and have trained over 80,000 individuals to improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, public transportation operators, aviation workers, oil refinery process operators, and many, many more. If you or someone you know works in a high-risk, high-consequence, decision-making environment, we're here to help to improve your safety and your survival and to help you accomplish the most important mission of all, and that is to go home to the ones who love you. By the time this episode airs, I will have just completed my six-week sabbatical from all presentations. And for those of you who are connected with me on my social media, you will know that I have went on a 500-mile pilgrimage across Spain called the Camino de Santiago, or the Way of St. James. If you want to learn more about it, just Google it. If you want to see some of the adventures that I was on, just check out my social media channels. I'd like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters training for their team members. The Coastal Bend Regional Advisory Council in Corpus Christi, Texas. The Safety Plus Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana. The Louisiana Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Peoria, Illinois. And the Clearwater Regional Fire Service in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. If you're interested in attending a program, here's where we're going to be upcoming. On November 14 through 17, I'll be in Clearwater Beach, Florida, doing a presentation for the International Association of Fire Chiefs Volunteer and Combination Officer Section Symposium in the Sun. On November 23rd, I will be in Grand Prairie, Alberta, doing a program for the County of Grand Prairie Fire Services. If you want to see the locations of all the upcoming events, just head over to the samatters.com website and click on the red tab labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. If you're interested in hosting a program, just click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the samatters.com page and I will give you a call. If you want to become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there are several ways you can do that. Check the show notes for how to get connected with us by signing up for our monthly newsletter, by subscribing to the SA Matters radio podcast, by subscribing to the SA Matters TV YouTube channel, and how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 291 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Lieutenant Ron Hunter from Spartanburg Fire Department. Thank you to our platinum sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Sims You Share. Thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, organizations, and associations that have hosted Situational Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted a live stream training program where I come to your organization live 
via the internet to train your members. Thank you to the more than 3,000 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. The feedback I've received from Academy graduates is just amazing and humbling, and I thank you for that. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.